All right. Hello. <laughs> hey, Alex. How's it going? I'm well, how are you, Hass? Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Speaking to you from the future. Cool. Oh, that's right. You're, uh, yes, you're a few time zones ahead of me. Yeah. It's still Sunday where I am. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your weekend. We're in uh, full swing, full swing Monday or half swing. We'll, uh, we'll see how this, uh, we'll see how this week's goes. Cool. So um, just to open the, the channel. So this is my, uh, this is my channel, which is a little bit different than the podcast channel. Uh, so this is going to be kind of, hopefully not just outtakes, but more candid. Uh, it'll be kind of one-on-one -on -one with uh, people I know personally in the space that are doing cool things. And yeah, uh, it's an experiment. This is episode one, recording one. <laughs> I'm completely terrified. I was going to say mildly, but completely. Uh, the inner perfectionist and introvert in me is like, what are you doing? But um, I suppose, I don't know. That's good. Oh, you'll be fine. My first ever pod appearance, I was a bumbling mess. Uh, you do. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's practice makes perfect. You'll be fine. Cool. You'll be more than fine. Well, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and I've been kind of threatening to do video on the podcast. Uh, the problem with that is the podcast is, um, it's not highly edited, but I do take a lot of time with all of the episodes, uh, usually about 20 hours worth, uh, which is one of the reasons why the episodes can be so infrequent. I want to make sure that it's, you know, quality and people are not surprised by questions, but uh, I guess we're in the era of YouTube now, so... <laughs> I wanted quality. Is. Why did you? Why did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense. No, you've got. Um, you've had your channel up for a while, and I'd like to get into that. Um, so I have kind of a rough script. Uh, so let's get started with uh, an intro um, about you know who is Hass. So uh, Hass is a Bitcoiner first and foremost, but uh, but in the pre-Bitcoin, uh, my pre-Bitcoin life and my current life really. I was a uh, civil engineer specializing in heavy infrastructure. So uh, my whole life, uh, especially uh, going to high school and, you know, experiencing adolescence and opening my mind in the third world, uh, I've always been, you know, a, a big empath. And I used to believe, you know, fixing the world all boiled down to, you know, uh, infrastructure and, uh, you know, uh, uh, politics. Uh, luckily, luckily enough, uh, I found out that politics was a, was a scam many, 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 many years ago, and uh, I just focused on uh, on infrastructure building. So uh, when I found out uh, about Bitcoin and started getting into it and learning about it in uh, Bubble 2013, November 2013, uh, I figured out basically it's the only piece of infrastructure worth caring about. So uh, that's. Uh, that's me. So I'm. Uh, uh, with that said, uh, you know, not much I can do for the for the Bitcoin world, uh, other than stack sats, and uh, I suppose uh, mold my previous uh, experience, education, and, and skill set uh, to assess and analyze uh, Bitcoin. So I've had a lot of experience, uh, obviously building multi-billion-dollar infrastructure, uh, uh, mines, tunnels. Uh, environmental impact assessments. So I do understand uh, uh, a lot of uh, real world uh, stuff uh, that Bitcoin sort of forays into, uh, especially with, with things like mining, environmental impacts uh, and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, the second bent I have is the sort of uh, startup strategy entrepreneurial uh, bent, uh, but that's, I suppose, uh, a little bit more academic uh, after my uh, MBA at Oxford. So uh, uh, I was hoping uh, to have presented my uh, Bitcoin as a startup framework at value of Bitcoin uh, Munich in late May. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I've considered that ticket money as a donation to Etihad Airways and uh, I'll be grounded in Sydney for uh, uh, TBA. Yeah, that's, um, we'll get into the, the COVID stuff and all of the, the travel uh, restrictions and everything. It's a, it's a really interesting time to be alive right now. Um, I don't know. I, I wrote something on Twitter earlier today. It feels kind of like a, a global reset, if you will. Yeah, I think it's, uh, look, I think it's been that uh, it's, 
for Bitcoiners, it's like a, a dog chasing a car. And uh, now we've finally <laughs> caught the car. And I don't think we were expecting to catch it yet. So uh, even though, you know, COVID sort of came around and uh, blindsided everyone, uh, I suppose this uh, finally gets to put Bitcoin to its first real world test. Uh, and it looks like so far uh, it's holding up uh, relatively well. Uh, you know, some people might say, oh, yeah, it's down, you know, 40% uh, or whatever it is. But yeah, so is, you know, so is the stock market. If a, if a stock market falls 40%, you'd expect Bitcoin to fall 95%. Uh, but that just simply isn't the case. So uh, I think uh, now is our time to shine. I agree, 100%. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really, uh, I don't know, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's like, I feel this weird sense of calm. And at the same time, I'm on high alert. And I don't know if, if others around the world are, are feeling that. But it's really interesting when you see like all of your institutions crumble. And, you know, it, living through two financial collapses now. Uh, I mean, that's, it's pretty earth shattering. Like all of these things that were kind of propped up as, you know, these are completely safe. I think uh, it was at Armin Ben Bitcoin had put something out uh, earlier uh, saying, you know, two weeks basically from the economy will, ne will never fail to what's going on. <laughs> I'm, I'm vastly paraphrasing, but. And, uh, and this is just, this is just the beginning. So uh, on the, on my way uh, back from site, uh, just an hour ago, I took a, I took a video. I should post the video to Twitter. Uh, in Australia, we've got something called uh, Centrelink, which is basically, you know, uh, uh, unemployment and, you know, community services. And uh, the, the, the Centrelink line must have been two, three hundred meters long this morning. No social distancing. If there was social distancing, that line would be a kilometer long. Uh, but yeah, here we are a, a week after the crisis has hit Australia and the unemployment lines stretch as far as you can see. So uh, yeah, it's just the beginning. This, uh, these uh, multi hundred billion and multi trillion dollar uh, uh, stimuli, that's, they're just the beginning. So uh, it's, it's not nice to see people uh, lose their jobs and uh, and I've always asserted on my several uh, podcast appearances that uh, you know, the hyper bitcoinization event is not going to be a nice event it's not going to be you know sort of a smooth transition it'll be a hard landing uh, you know for you know for several people and you know in my sort of facetious and, and comedic religious uh, pieces uh, that I write mm -hmm. I, I do mention, you know, the economic hereafter. Uh, and I think we're in the middle of Judgment Day. Uh, and we'll just see what happens come the other side. It's either going to be heaven or it's going to be hell. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think as society, there's, there's always been this, you know, black and white, right or wrong. Um, it almost feels like we're mature enough as humanity, maybe. I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm being a little bit more hopeful about it. Um, but it feels like maybe there won't be that binary. Oops, hang on. <laughs> maybe there won't be that binary choice anymore uh, where it won't be either heaven or hell. And it almost, uh, it just it really feels like we're stepping into a new, a new economic paradigm, which I know sounds kind of philosophy, you know, like too much in the hand wavy philosophy realm. Um, but I mean, everything is fundamentally changing. I and mean, we're getting what trillions of dollars printed. Uh, it's what five trillion dollars right now that's been injected into the economy or something ridiculous. The, the, um, the there are literally going economy? to be two, what? Sorry? You mean the international economy or just the US? Just the US economy. So, as far there's, as I know, there's been, no? there's been trillions. There, yeah. there has been trillions. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's five, but look, it will be uh, by the end of it. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, I'm uh, very on board with uh, Bitcoin Tina and we speak all the time and uh, we reckon by the end of this. So uh, before all of this uh, happened, uh, the Fed had, I think, uh, 4.1 trillion on its balance sheet. Uh, the ECB 
and uh, uh, People's Bank of China had 5.2 trillion and the Bank of Japan had 5.3 trillion. Uh, I think by the end of this, uh, they'll all have a minimum of 10 trillion on their balance sheets. Japan, we'll see what Japan does. They haven't been hit that hard uh, yet, so they probably won't need multi-trillion dollar uh, stimuli. Uh, but we'll just have to we'll just have to see what happens. Mm -hmm. And you know, whatever whatever has happened to America economically, uh, it's going to be worse for China. So nobody knows how many trillions they put down. You know, after sh after closing down uh, uh, seven hundred and sixty million people for five or six months. Uh, but I can imagine it'll be four or five trillion that they uh, that they would have needed to uh, distribute to keep everything ticking along. So uh, yeah, it's it's just the start of the trillions and trillions and trillions. So uh, yeah, money printer go brrr, and uh, <laughs> uh, and maybe number go up. We'll mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what happens. It's really funny. Um, one of the things that I always get in, uh, you know, when talking to people about Bitcoin, especially if they're not used to it or they're they're new to the space, um, they want to, you know, Bitcoin is so volatile and it's killing the environment and all of the, you know, standard FUD. Um, I mean, it's a new asset for sure. It's a new market asset. It's only been around for just, uh, you know, just over a decade. Um, but really, it calls into question what is value. You know, when people are comparing Bitcoin, which is you know, against a dollar that is inflationary. I mean, they're fundamentally different things. Bitcoin has a fixed supply. Um, USD doesn't ever since it's come off of the gold standard. Um, so, and even gold itself, I mean, you could always find new gold deposits potentially. So Bitcoin is very unique in that it's, it's fixed supply. You know, you can have up to, I think it's what, eight decimal places. Um, so there's- well, now. Could be could be more. Yeah, you know, when we get to a when we get to a dollar a sat, we're going to need a couple more decimal places. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so strange. I mean, it's it's one of the fundamental um big questions like how do you confer value on something? How do you act in society um when money no longer makes sense and are we moving as society to uh you know, a post money world? And you know, what does that look like? How do we how do we transact in a world like that? I think, and I think it's not just on money, but I think we're starting to see this, uh, especially now with this pandemic that's happening. Uh, we're seeing that worldwide on pretty much everything from supply chain to, you know, we're, we're all quarantined mostly and under, you know, pretty harsh travel bans, um, very restrictive for, you know, for whatever, um, whatever your views on that. I think it's, yeah, it's really weird, really interesting times to be uh, in this world at this time. Yeah, look, I think, you know, when this all blows over and uh, and we look back, it's like look back at it, uh, this is the end of money as we know it. Uh, it's like, and, and I'm saying when it all blows over, I mean, you know, after the trillions and trillions and trillions of, uh, you know, of stimulus have, have been injected, I think it'll be a third world and developing world economies and societies that that collapse, that will cause a will cause a, a trigger uh, to move off legacy currency. I'm not sure how it'll go in the developed world. Like I'm just not not bold enough to predict what'll happen with the U.S. Like mm -hmm. they could probably just prop themselves up forever with funny money. Uh, but you know, like. Uh, African nations, Middle Eastern nations, Latin American nations sort of get a bit crippled uh, by Corona. Uh, I'm sure you could uh, expect to see hyperinflation there, uh, which will result in either a migration to the US dollar or to Bitcoin. And who's going to trust the US dollar when they're just printing trillions and trillions and trillions? So definitely, uh, the the world is now is now different. We are we are entering. Uh, an unprecedented time uh, mm -hmm. in history. So uh, the other the other day, uh, Gigi posted uh, an article called uh, "Dear Legacy People," and I'd mm -hmm. uh, and I'd recommend uh, everyone go out and read that. And it's basically uh, it's a it's a good salient summary of uh, how the world we knew yesterday 
no longer no longer exists. Yeah, it's a really great article. Um, I have that posted on my Twitter as well. Um, yeah, it's and shout out to Gigi and congratulations. He's just had a baby. Oh, nice. Uh, the other day. Cool. So, uh, wishing uh, wishing Bub and uh, and Mum all uh, all the best. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah, it's got to be a, a fairly scary prospect right now, um, bringing new life into the world. Um, but, you know, I mean, life goes on. So I think it's important. But yeah, um, all the kudos and, and luck to him and his family. Yeah, very, uh, very interesting times. Uh, but it's a good, good thing that he's a Bitcoiner. So uh I always use the, you know, use the, the joking term, uh, uh, stack sats for salvation. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think uh, people will understand what I mean by sal salvation uh, very, very soon. It's uh, your, your Satoshis are your ticket to heaven in the, in the economic hereafter. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I'd actually like to get a little bit into your channel. So um, yeah, all of your teachings and, and learnings, and it has kind of a an ecumenical bent, if you will. Um, yes. <laughs> so tell our listeners that are are not our listeners, I guess our viewers um, who are not familiar with your channel, what it's all about and why you started so, uh, it. So uh, it's uh, it's not something I I maintain and and regularly keep up to date. It's exact basically it started off uh, as an update. To my uh, environmental uh, and cost analysis of Bitcoin. So, one of the first ever things uh, I did in the in the Bitcoin world was back all the way back in 2014. Uh, you know, in the in the post Bitcoin crash uh, world, and I uh, put together something like a 30,000 page report on uh, on the cost and sustainability of Bitcoin. So uh, it didn't really go too far, and I was a bit demoralized by by mid 2014, and I sort of just went away. Uh, came back in uh, in uh, August 2018, so about you know a uh, a year to eight months after the crash, when I started seeing environmental fud articles pop up again, and I thought to myself, God damn it, this has been the same shit for five years. Like, hasn't anybody like properly address this yet uh so i said all right i'm gonna have to update my report to include the newest data uh and then uh, i'm gonna make a video series about it so that people can uh, you know step by step follow along in you know in 10 minute little bite sized uh, uh hits uh, about literally about why uh, bitcoin has effectively uh, no adverse uh, environmental impacts. So, uh, so that was a ten-parter. Uh, I've got a couple of other, you know, little facetious videos about the about the religious aspect of Bitcoin and mm -hmm. and DCAing, uh, and uh, then a, a, a smattering of uh, all of the pod appearances uh, I've been on, uh, as well as uh, a lot of the uh, presentations uh, I've uh, I've given. So there was a, a, a long presentation called Bitcoin in 90 minutes. And I've uh, also split that up into several, several little parts. It was a, it was a, uh, it was a presentation in five acts. Uh, I, I pat my back. I pat myself on the back saying, uh, if you want to introduce a pre-coiner to Bitcoin, uh, not many, not many presentations better than that one. Cool. So, uh, uh, so yeah, that's effectively my channel. Probably got about twenty videos on there. Uh, uh, some of it serious, some of it not so serious. Uh, just a, a good time uh, in general. So, where can people find that? Uh, that's uh, YouTube uh, dot com slash. Oh, I want to get this right. I think it's slash Hasma Cook. Uh, but I can I can double. You know what? I'm going to check that right now. Sounds good. But yeah, effectively, if, if you search for my name in YouTube, yeah, you'll find it. But yeah, uh, 
Yes, youtube.com slash Hass McCook. So uh, I'm guessing you'll put that in your show notes as well. Yes, yes. Um, and this is this will all be brand new, so I uh, hope I can edit those. Um, I guess I'll find out. <laughs> yeah. So on on top of that, also like uh, my YouTube videos are effectively video uh, transcripts of my Medium articles. So if you do want to check out Medium, it's medium.com slash at asthma cook. So uh, yeah, and uh, the, the Medium articles tend to be a lot more detailed than the videos, just, uh, you know, the videos are, are, are technical and, and packed with information and boring enough as is, then to try load them up with even more uh, boring stuff. Fair enough. Um, one thing I wanted to check, you said you had a 30,000 page document. Was it 30,000 words no, or 30,000 word. pages? Words. Okay. Word, word. <laughs> I was going to say that's a 30, very good I think document. I, that was the old one. The new one's 35,000. So <laughs> it's still a solid read. Like you'll need, you'll need like two hours to, to get through it. Like it gets down into the minutia of, uh, of the economic aspects, the environmental aspects, the, uh, uh, uh competitive so it goes into micro macro and uh and nano if you want to call that mm -hmm. uh, so like a strategy business strategy at a company level at an industry level and so on and so forth so if you if you want a good uh sort of a summary and crash course on microeconomics uh, that's the way to go so uh there's plenty of macroeconomic content uh, all over uh, the space uh, but I found that the microeconomic stuff, business strategy, entrepreneurship uh, is a little lacking, which I'm not surprised by because uh, I've, I've found that there's, uh, uh, in terms of uh, entrepreneurial strategy and strength, uh, our industry is still uh, a bit weak and immature. Uh, but I expect that to, to change uh, soon enough. Well, it's, it's a new industry. So, um, you know, the people that understand um, how the, the product is built, um, it's rarer typically to find somebody who knows how, who understands the, you know, the full, like what Bitcoin is and also how to build a business around it. Yeah. Um, I think that's like that anywhere though. Uh, it's hard to have that technical understanding and that business sense, not to say that well, there aren't a lot of people in the world that have that or don't have that. Yeah, no, that's definitely, definitely <laughs> My Canadianness is showing a, now. As an, as, an, as an engineer, uh, we did this subject at university. It's just called engineering enterprise, uh, oh. just to try teach us how to, you know, uh, create a business plan and all that. Cause uh, we, we can design the products uh, and the product can be the best product in the world, but if you can't market it or sell it or build a business around it, it's, uh, it's fairly useless. Uh, and even uh, even when I was uh, doing uh, doing my MBA, uh, there were a couple of subjects that you know the business school kids would be you know in class, and there'd also be a lot of like uh, PhD kids, you know from you know faculty of genomics and all of that kind of stuff with the uh, with the intent to have them team up uh, with you know with other MBAs to develop pitches, uh, uh, you know uh, fundraise all of that kind of stuff. So. Uh, yeah, like you said, very, very early. The price is still very, very low. Uh, I expect when, when we're looking at a $100,000 Bitcoin, uh, uh, VCs uh, and you know, uh, entrepreneurs will be flocking uh, to the space and uh, they don't have to come in as volunteers. So when you've got a $100,000 Bitcoin, your Bitcoin companies probably have a bit more room to try hire people. Mm -hmm. Uh, because yeah, a lot of these guys can do with some, uh, uh, you know, marketing and, and business, uh, people. I agree. It's, uh, it's an interesting if you look back to the whole ICO craze and people building on top of Ethereum, and I, I don't want to spend too much time going there, but, uh, what was interesting about that is there was a lot of marketing dollars, um, are in a system that arguably, I think, and I'm going to get a lot of heat for this, uh, that doesn't work. Um, I mean, Ethereum's not scalable. It's essentially a centralized uh, system that's being rebuilt digitally, if you will. Um, whereas Bitcoin is something that's fundamentally different. It is decentralized. Um, you know, there's there's so many things about it that are, you know, it's different. It's a different value proposition to, um, you know, what is value and what is money. 
Um, so I think it's interesting as we're starting to see people build on Bitcoin, um, like build tokens and, and other things and other you know, financial instruments on top of, of Bitcoin. Um, I think that's really interesting. And yeah, um, I agree. You know, I'll, the whole take, market I'll take the heat off you. <laughs> Please do. Put it on to me. <laughs> So uh, uh, Vitalik created Ethereum because he was cut. He didn't get into Bitcoin early enough and make money off it. So he decided to go take his ball and go home and uh, make something that he could pre-mine and get rich off. And uh, my hand on my heart, I'll always think that. So all these shit coiners that went off to make shit coins, they just cut. They didn't get into Bitcoin early to make, make like to get rich. Uh, it is what it is. So the heat is off you and on me now. Uh, but, that's, uh, but for me, that's the only logic, like that's the only logical conclusion uh, that, you know, someone can come to like Ethereum. You know, if this kid was such a boy genius, he would have figured out a way to build Ethereum on top of Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at the, you know, the design, if you will, where it's, I mean, it's yeah. Um, it's a very complex diagram for, you know, and things are always going to be built and it's now Ethereum 2.0 and 3.0. And anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on it because I, I but I, I did think it was important to talk about, you know, we did see marketing in the space, uh, when people think of cryptocurrency and you kind of saw, you know, this big ICO bubble and all of these scams and things that didn't work versus, you know, now we're starting to see more maturity with Bitcoin and, um, you know, that Bitcoin itself is, you know, I mean, it's not a business. There's no CEO. And this is the one of the hardest things I find to describe to people is that, you know, there's, there's no one central creator. It's a, it's almost an organism unto itself uh, that self organizes. Um, I don't know if you're to refer it to Star Trek, it's almost like the Borg. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed. Uh, look, I, uh, I do view it as a, uh, as a as a startup as a company so that was uh what i was very excited to, to present uh, in munich mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's a company with a with a founder but no c-suite uh, uh volunteers but no employees uh, uh no no uh, uh it's it's self-marketed and uh, it's basically a, a, I call it a decentralized unorganization. Hmm. So uh, it's, yeah, it's an organized unorganization. So uh, obviously it's, it's hard to, to build analogies uh, for Bitcoin, uh, but in terms uh, of it, you know, looking like a company, it's a startup that's going through lots of stages. We're about to go into our series B fundraising round in a, in a few <laughs> weeks time. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, I view it like, so, uh, if you view the difficulty uh, or sorry, the reward eras as stages of a startup life, the first reward era was, uh, you know, the, the angel, angel round bootstrapping round, uh, where you had, uh, you know, eff effectively people working for free, very low margin. Uh, bootstrapping it themselves, all of this kind of kind of stuff. Then you went on to the seed, and we're currently now uh, 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 era three. This is the Series A round. Mm -hmm. uh, next halving, next uh, era will be Series B. Then after that, Series C, and then uh, then we IPO. So uh, <laughs> I believe we've got a, a million dollar coin at IPO. Mm -hmm which is, you know, in eight and a half, nine years. Uh, but now that money printer is going brrr so hard, uh, <laughs> like that could come, uh, that could come a lot sooner. You never know. Yeah. It's, um, hmm. it's really, really interesting times. Um, I think it's a good thing. Um, I think it's, I think ultimately it will be a good thing. I shouldn't, um, I think a lot of people right now are like super scared. And you know they don't know what's going on. You know there's there massive is job loss. Sorry, there is reason to be scared. Like uncertainty is always very scary. Mm -hmm. Like obviously you shouldn't be scared. You know, like you know, being you know, literally scared to death or, or scared of dying and all that kind of stuff. 
but it is very uncertain times. People might lose their jobs. Like uh, there is, uh, you know, there is justification for, for being, you know, vigilant and, uh, you know, planning, uh, you know, because there, there will be eventualities that uh, are, are negative uh, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, we're still very, very early into the piece. There's only, well, only uh, 330,000 uh, cases. Uh, if uh, if you, you believe what the, what the scientists are saying, like that Imperial College report and all that, like we are just getting started. Uh, you know, there could be, uh, you know, tens of millions uh, of infections, not necessarily deaths, uh, but, you know, a lot of infections, people staying at home, uh, you know, work uh, grinding to a halt. It is, it is a scary time and it's justified uh, to be scared. Like you're not crazy uh, for being, uh, being scared. Now you shouldn't panic as a result of that fear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is, these are scary times, uncertain times. Totally. Yeah, it's, um, I agree with the don't panic part. Um, I mean, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. It's, <laughs> it's very important not to panic. It's extremely important <laughs> not to panic. And there's, yeah. look, there's no cause for panic. Uh, there's only, you know, cause for panic if you create it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, take care of yourself. You know, try not to go out so much. And uh, just it's effectively take it one day at a time and just see what happens. Yeah. It's one of the things that, that kind of stands out to me. It's like what happens to humanity when society stops? And it kind of feels like we're at that point, you know, everyone is social distancing, self quarantining, um, pretty much every business where there's in-person gathering, uh, where there previously was, has been closed except for supermarkets. Um, I'm now starting to see here, you know, like two meters between people, uh, in grocery stores, there's lots of limits on things, which I think is good. I think the, you know, we saw a little bit of panic buying. And so seeing limits is probably good. I, I, I'm, I'm always fundamentally against uh, restrictions of freedom. Uh, but at the same time, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't look, know this if is a perfect thing, system. Look, it's, it's, it's a big topic uh, these days, and I didn't really have a have a lash out. I just was taking the piss a little by saying, you know, this is the reason why libertarians never have or ever will uh, be in charge of anything. Because look, <laughs> uh, a lot of people that are hardcore libertarians, God, God bless them, and I'm a, I consider myself probably a weaker uh, libertarian. These people have never lived in the third world. Uh, in like war or occupation, uh, they've never needed to to study under candlelight. They are completely detached. Uh, the non-aggression principle does not work in practice. Hmm. All right. Sometimes hmm. you have to for sometimes you have to impose uh, non-aggression. Uh, you have to enforce. You have to enforce non-aggression with aggression. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of like libertarians live by the non-aggression principle and all that kind of stuff. But 95% of the people, I'm sorry to say, basically are savages when they panic. Hmm. When the panic kicks in and the fear kicks in, animal instincts kick in. Uh, and you can bet your bottom dollar that people aren't going to act in the, in the common broader interest. Uh, so that's why like the libertarians just need to call it slightly. Uh, but I definitely agree uh, uh, we shouldn't stand for overly totalitarian principles. Like, for example, cracking our cell phones uh, to see if we're socially distancing. Mm -hmm. uh, but some people, right, no matter what you try to do, they're just not going to socially distance. So there has to be some mechanism uh, of enforcement uh, on those people. That's why you see in places like France, if you go out and, you know, and you don't have your, your papers or your license, uh, you'll get a fine, uh, be, you know, if there's no need for you uh, to be outside. So I don't know what the, I don't know what the solution here is or the, or the middle ground, but uh, having lived, uh, you know, as a Westerner, you know, being brought up in the West and then going through adolescence and puberty uh, in Lebanon, uh, where we, where I was there for an occupation, 
and liberation in the year 2000s, uh, bombing raids in 99 and 2000, uh, NAP doesn't work. Hmm. Like when society is, you know, like in under normal circumstances, like, yeah, cool. Libertarianism all the way. Uh, but sometimes it just, uh, when you have societal collapse, uh, uh, extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. But, uh, I, but I agree with the super extraordinary of like complete uh, 100% total surveillance. Uh, yeah, look, I don't, know what the, I don't know what the solution is, uh, but I, I do feel for, for situations like this, uh, like sometimes, sometimes you have to just, uh, it's, it's for the people that don't listen that ruin it for all of us. That's the, that's the problem. And uh, with, with libertarianism, much like communism and socialism and all the other isms, mm -hmm. unless everyone is doing it, it doesn't work. So communism, for example, doesn't work if just half the population decides to do it. Like it has to be imposed on everyone or it doesn't work. And that goes from communism to socialism to uh, libertarian uh, non-aggression principle-ism. Unless everyone's on board, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's... Um, I think we've seen so many examples in the past of uh, well-intentioned people at the very beginning, and it turns dark very quickly. And I think that that's something that we've seen continually time and time again. You know, um, arguably since the... You know, we haven't had a world war, like a traditional world war since the 40s. Um, so arguably most people have not lived through the, you know, those kinds of, of situations, unless you've been part of a, a you know, a, a war in other parts of the, the world, like you were saying. And I'd love to dig more into, you know, your experience there. Um, actually, it might be a good time to, to talk about it now. Um, what was kind of the, the day to day and what were the overarching, um, you know, what, what was going on? What was going on through your mind? How was it growing up? Did you notice anything different? Um, how did it compare to, you know, the traditional Western world and Western values? And um, yeah, just let's maybe dig into that a little bit. So look, uh, Lebanon is a very resilient place, which is under occupation and war pretty much every five, 10 years for the past 7,000 years. So, uh, <laughs> so in terms of, you know, what happens in the wake uh, of bombings, uh, it's, you know, everyone gets freaked out for three, four days. Uh, you do hear war planes breaking the, breaking the sound barrier, uh, you know, no, no electricity, uh, you know, uh, roads closed, restriction of services. Uh, but, you know, the Lebanese people, they're, um, they're just resilient. So basically, uh, I left there in, uh, in 03 to go back to Australia. My family uh, stayed there. Uh, in the 06 war, I remember when I rang my sister to check on her, I'm like, you know, how are things going? She's like, oh, you know, all right, we're, we're up in the mountains partying. We've just shifted, you know, from, you know, Beirut, which was, you know, under, you know, under, you know, bombing and all that. We've just gone up to the mountains and we're partying and drinking and all that kind of stuff. So there is resilience uh, there. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh Lots, there's still uh, big, big like refugee camps in Lebanon with hundreds of thousands of, of Palestinians. Uh, right now, 25% of the Lebanese population is Syrian refugees. Uh, so I would, I would invite these libertarians to come down to Beirut and, and let's, let's put their non-aggression principle to the test. Although probably not now <laughs> with all of them, yeah. I know, oh, Corona would be the least of their worries. I'll tell you that. Yeah, so that's why a lot of you know the hardcore, like libertarians, like really, I invite them to come down to anywhere in the third world uh, that's under like a, a small amount of crisis, and let's see how they go with their non-aggression principle. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Because when people are hungry. Uh, they're going to be aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, it sounds, it sounds raw, 
uh, but you know, this is the, this is the case for four, five billion people. Yeah. Yeah. We do forget that. I mean, most of the people I've talked to that are kind of weathering the storm, um, you know, we're all kind of stocked up. We've got, you know, we've, we didn't do the panic buying necessarily, but, um, I think most people that are self-sufficient tend to have, you know, they've, they've done the, the shopping, they're, they're set. So it's a much easier position to, to be in, uh, versus if you're in the, you know, if you're, if you're in the eye of the storm versus in the full storm itself. And I think that maybe that's how, how some of us are, are situated right now. No. I don't know. Look again, that's a West thing. Mm -hmm. For the other six billion people, sure, like stockpiling is a nice idea, but these people can barely eat for today. Mm -hmm. And we're asking them to stock up three weeks of food. Yeah. So like so well, that's that's the one thing that sometimes irritates me about the about the Bitcoin world is the is the first world mentality. Uh, especially for uh, uh, especially since there's such a big narrative around that, you know, Bitcoin uh, is going to be one of the things that helps the third world. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little bit more third world empathy uh, will will go a long way, I think. Yeah, you've got, a, you've got a point there. So how are how are you personally weathering the all the COVID stuff and the travel ban and how is uh, how has that impacted you? Oh, it hasn't really hasn't really impacted me actually. So I uh, hung out at home all weekend, uh, you know, uh, consuming doom porn. So I think uh, <laughs> yeah, I've definitely got a doom porn addiction now. Well, uh, what's it called? It's a great time uh, th these days for doom porn addicts. So uh, plenty of uh, plenty of content. Uh, been playing around uh, with uh, with my node. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's always stuff to do. I think the the podcast and you know YouTube video circuit is going to go through the roof because there's nothing really else to do. Mm -hmm. so it's a good way to interact with people. Uh, but yeah, there's there's nothing else. There's nothing else you can do really. I'm uh, I'm immunocompromised, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm taking no risk. Uh, you know. What can you do? It's a couple of months. Yeah, hang out at home. So yeah. we're st still going into work. Mm -hmm. uh, the construction industry does not does not stop. Uh, but we'll just we'll have to see what happens. The the union is meeting this week on Friday, mm -hmm. and uh, you know depending on how bad uh, the case count gets, we'll see if uh, construction will stay. Uh, operational or not so we've got something like i think uh us and uh, us and you guys we're neck and neck uh for cases yeah so i think Absolutely. you guys are only like 20 ahead of us so uh, i'd say whatever happens uh policy wise uh with you guys will probably follow or the other way around but yeah we weren't taking it seriously at all uh last week and uh, when that thousand number, that magic number hit, I think it, it kind of hit everyone, uh, which is, you know, which is unfortunate that it, you know, haven't these people been watching what's happened overseas? Like 200 becomes a thousand very quickly. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, hopefully they get a handle on it soon enough. But again, no reason to be scared. No reason to panic. It's like, you know, you do your social distancing. You do your washing your hands. Like, like nothing's gonna happen. As long as you, as long as you stick religiously to the to the hand washing or hand sanitizing and social distancing, like it's it's not a problem. The problem is the people that it's just not getting through to their heads that they got to social distance and wash their hands. Yeah. So again, in the case of if we all do it, it it's going to work perfectly. But if some people don't, then they wreck it for everyone. Yeah, and it's a it's a hard thing. I mean, how do you like? I I 100% don't agree with like police state measures, and I hope we don't need to get there. 
Um, I hope we're evolved enough as society and humanity, even though we're probably post society, at least at this point right now. Um, yeah, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if people could just, you know, think and just follow kind of basic human decency and, and things like that. Um, I know that's asking a lot, but <laughs> I think that there's more of us that are, um, are able to do that and, and willing to do that. And, and really it's just getting the word out there too. Um, I definitely empathize with people that are, you know, have been in lockdown. And I think that that itself is probably overkill. I think we're probably going to look back and see, you know, like that extreme measure. And it's, it's like every, everything that you go through, there's always like wide swings from, you know, doing nothing to like over control and totalitarianism. Um, I really feel for the people that are, um, are under that lockdown state right now. Um, especially like the shelter in place. And I mean, that itself is, it's almost, you know, it's, it's like being in jail. It's like being in a self-imposed jail. Um, so that's tough. Um, so I don't know. It's uh, it's well, not an is, easy situation, you know. As long as it's self-imposed and voluntary, like I'm, I'm very happy to do it. And I think the problem is in the past, I don't know, 10 years, maybe, maybe particularly five years, uh, there's been, uh, you know, the, the, the phenomenon of having your own truth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people were all watching the same exact movie, uh, but we all see, you know, three different things. And I think the, the, you know, the, the collapse in a central truth, uh, has resulted in misinformation, conspiracies, and just lack of trust. Like me personally, I both don't trust the government and I don't trust journalists. Mm -hmm. So who do I trust? Uh, like, and, and that's the problem. There's been a lot of, you know, erosion of trust in both authority and the legacy media. Uh, you know, so how do you how do you get the correct public health message out so two three months ago the who was saying you can't transmit it person to person uh, masks are useless uh and now all of a sudden it's different so who do you trust mm -hmm. yeah and and that's that's creating uh, a lot of a lot of these problems now because you know you have a lot of fringe people saying you know whatever the government says you got to do the opposite they're lying to us or whatever cnn is telling us you got to do the opposite they're lying to us and and you know so on and so forth so it's it's become difficult to mount a successful public health campaign uh, which convinces enough people to put themselves under voluntary self quarantine where you don't have to call in uh, the military to enforce self quarantine because really with with enough evidence with enough education uh, you know, I, I really do have enough faith in people that they take the lesson on board and, and you know, act in their, in their own interest and, and, you know, society's broader interest as well. Uh, but yeah, this, this changes everything uh, where, you know, money will change forever, media will change forever, uh, information dissemination will change forever, uh, uh, globalization will change uh, forever. Uh, you know, once this all blows over, I think China is going to lose a lot of business. A lot of people will be bringing factories back home. Uh, so who who knows what's going to happen? Uh, but yeah, I think the collapse of uh, of trust in in broad legacy institutions, you know, from government to journalism to banking, whatever, uh, I think has been exposed uh, in in this time of uh, crisis. Yeah. You know, um, for me, one of the things that um, there's that sense of control and anytime somebody says you have to do this, but they can't explain why, um, usually it's to their benefit. And, it, you know, that becomes written into law eventually until you have this kind of polarized society. Um, so yeah, it, it is hard, hard to trust, I think, for some people, like follow all of these rules and you see all these like these irresponsible practices like all of the you know i don't know 
<laughs> I, I'm not sure I want to go down this tangent. Um, but uh, it is hard to, to trust your sources of information. And it's fine yeah. not to trust because, you know, like it's not like they have the best track record uh, as of late. Yeah, I think, you know, and there's, there's always, I believe anyway, there's always good people um, around the world trying to, to do good things. But um, the majority of the, the world, there's, you know, traditionally that's not been the case. So how do you, you know, move forward to everyone's benefit? And I think that's possible. I don't think that's a utopia. I think that's definitely a possibility. But how do we do that? How do we do that at society? And I think that definitely this... <laughs> I agree. History has always shown us the, the more the more force used, the worse uh, the eventual outcome. Uh, but yeah, like we're 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 putting all of these theories to the test uh, right now. Uh, again, going back to Lebanon, uh, the population decided to move to move on it before the government did, and everyone just stayed at home. That's good. So like, uh, so sometimes because like, uh, well, the, the Lebanese uh, government and central bank both defaulted last week. So 40% uh, of the population is now in poverty. Mm. Uh, now they've been hit with coronavirus uh, as well. Uh, but you know, the, the, they, they, the lack of trust in government is so, so deep uh, that they just didn't wait for government to do anything. They just, went off and did it themselves. So, so it can happen without force. It very much can, uh, mm -hmm. but it seems to be the correlation of lack of trust of government and, uh, and volunteerism. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting times. Um, I don't know. I mean, each day for me, it's, uh, you know, you sort of hear like, Celebrate every day like it's your last and live each day like it's your last. And oh, it's you know. not that bad. <laughs> no, that but I mean, it's not, it's, it's not going to be that bad for 90% of people. But I for agree. the 10%, there's just not enough beds for those 10%. And that's why it's going to be bad. Uh, so to save those 10%, like, let's all dig deep, uh, take a hit for a bit, and just stay home. Yeah, it's um you don't, you don't have to put a cop outside my house to make sure I don't leave. Like I'll do that of my own volition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and most people that we know and interact with on, on Twitter will do exactly that as well. But we're we're relying on a lot of other people to have the same attitude and do the same thing. Yep. And and yeah. I know the weather was nice in Sydney on Friday. Gorgeous. It was like thirty five degrees. Mm -hmm. the beaches were packed packed yeah every every beach thousands and then at the at the at the bars and pubs uh you know right next to the beach they're all packed mm -hmm. uh so yeah government had to had to step in on saturday and say no one's allowed you know at the beach uh mm -hmm. so the people just it hasn't hit them it's not real to them yet it was still oh there's only 400 cases or whatever like nothing's going to happen to me uh, but yeah, we're at 1400 now and, and doubling every three, four days. Yeah. And it's so, it's so uh, hard. The attitude has been a little cavalier. It's fair. It's, it's hard to, so for me, one of the things that, that sits with me is that, you know, this has been arguably, arguably out there since, um, since December. And if you look at, I think the New York Times put out a, a really nice visualization of migration patterns of people kind of from Wuhan and then all around the globe. And they showed, you know, potential cases or what they've been able to track so far as, as cases and then how that spreads. Um, so I think we're probably at the point where it's not controllable. Um, but then there's that thing you have to reconcile. Um, how quickly... Like that's the thing with exponential curves. At what point did we start going up the hockey stick? You know, was it back in December or was it in January or was it just recently? That's, I think in the, that's probably one of the hardest things for people to reconcile in general. It's like most people aren't used to the exponential curve. I mean, for those of us that have been around startups and, um, you know, more, more tech, uh, we are. But for people that aren't, uh, 
it's a really hard concept to wrap your head around. Like all of a sudden, you know, there's five cases and then, oh, you know, there's 25. And then very shortly, you know, you're at thousands upon thousands um, when it was just a few weeks ago, five. So how does, how does that reconcile? I don't know. There's also the virulence about it too. Uh, the fact that it's very contagious. Um, it for sure seems to be contagious. How can you tell who has it, who doesn't, and how do you control it? And um, <laughs> the more I'm talking about <laughs> What's that? You got it. Well, right now I've got seasonal allergies, so. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because I like, I heard some sniffles. I'm like, Ooh, I hope, uh, <laughs> hope the virus doesn't come through the computer. Yeah, no, all good, all good. And I know I've been like brushing my hair back and I've been itching your nose and it's like, um, I, I'm inside, you know, all my surfaces are cleaned and everything. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, just seasonal allergies. If I take anything for it, I will suffer tremendously the next couple of years. I'll get every cold and flu. Uh, so I just suffer through it for like two weeks and then two weeks in the fall and I'm fine. And some years I don't even have it, but of course now I do when everybody's sick right? Yeah. Hmm. Good times. But I have been monitoring just in case, like I have zero fever. Um, you know, I have no cough. I have no dry cough or no cough. So that's good. Um, yeah. It's just congestion. Thanks to, thanks to pollen and stuff. Yeah. Good old hay fever. Uh, yuck. All right. So we talked about Bitcoin. We've talked about world politics, philosophy, health, um, the economy. What else? Uh, life in general. <laughs> I think we've covered a lot. This is good. Yeah, no, I've had a, I've had a great time. Cool. Is there anything you want to close on? Is there anything you, um, so with the podcast, we always ask the uh, audience or we always ask our guests if there's something that like they'd like to ask the audience. So uh, now's your time. Is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with either to think or to reach out to you? Um, and if it's a reach out, how would they best get a hold of you? Yeah. So, uh, so I'd say uh, stay safe. I'm, uh, I'm planning on, uh, on releasing a, uh, a little article. I don't know when it's going to be. We'll see. We'll see what happens. It's called confessions of a Bitcoin bag holder. And, uh, and uh, I started writing it before the 50% crash. So uh, for any people, uh, you know, dealing with a 50% crash and feeling like a bag holder, uh, reach out. It's, uh, it's not the end of the world, especially uh, in, uh, in the context and the times uh, we're living in. So uh, try not to worry about Bitcoin. Uh, like Bitcoin is not important at a time like this. Uh, Bitcoin is here. It's here forever. It's not going to die. And it's going to just be here forever waiting for you. Uh, just make sure you, uh, uh, you take care of yourselves, your elders especially. Wash your hands. Keep your distance. Uh, be nice. Be patient. Uh, and, yeah, if you need to reach out, DMs are open. Awesome. How can people find you on, like, which platforms? I know you're on Twitter. You and I are connected there. Twitter is Twitter is probably uh, the, the, the best one. And you can find me on Twitter at Friar Hass, F-R-I-A-R-H-A-S-S. -S. Awesome. So I'll, uh, I'll, throw a, I'll throw a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> There's the B. Very cool. All right. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. We can stay on for a couple minutes if you want. And um, thanks so much for being my first guest. This is... Uh, uh, thank you this for having me. This has been great. Cool. Awesome. Um, all right, I'm going to stop the recording.